And today's topic is all about the SEC cyber rules. So uh, the SEC dropped a whole new set of rules on us with respect to reporting cybersecurity incidents and all the sort of regulations we need to follow as public companies. And so we'll talk through an action plan for both CISOs and CFOs. So um, with me here today is the Verona CFO and CEO, Guy Malamed. Guy, do you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your background? Absolutely. So uh, I've, my name's Guy. I've been uh, at Veronis for 12 years now, time flies. Um, worked before in public accounting and uh, I'm a CPA in uh, the US and actually have a CPA in Israel as well. Um, and very excited to talk about this subject. I think there's a lot to learn. Um, there's a lot to adopt and we'll try and make this interesting. Yeah, and uh, I'm Rob Sobers. I'm the CMO here at Veronis. I've also been in, at the company for about 12 years and uh, you know, it's crazy time does fly. We, we went public in 2014. So we're coming up on a decade of being public, which means we've had to work with the SEC quite a bit, right? You're no stranger to the SEC and all the different rules and the paperwork and logistics, right? It's a, uh, I'm sure it's your, the favorite, your favorite part of the job. Talk to all your CFOs. I'm sure it would be the least uh, favorite thing to do in, in their job. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to talk about why the SEC even cares about cybersecurity, right? They have a lot to worry about, you know, insider trading, all sorts of stuff, making sure that the exchanges work the way they're intended to work. So we'll talk about why they all of a sudden care about cybersecurity. We'll talk about what the new rules are, and then we'll dive deep into this four-day disclosure window, which is the hottest topic, I think, of all the changes being made here. Um, but we'll also touch on the periodic disclosure requirements and then give our advice on... Um, how to ready yourself, right? If you're a public company or a foreign issuer um, and, and suggest an action plan. And of course, uh, like I mentioned before, we'll do Q&A. But first we wanna learn a little bit about you. So um, I know we've got a bunch of registrants that are in cybersecurity and maybe work for a public company, maybe work for a private company and just interested in this topic. Um, but I'm sure we've got uh, some finance and legal folks on the call as well, as well as some consultants that help companies with their filings. So it looks like, whoa, we have a big group of cybersecurity pros, not unsurprising given Veronis is a cybersecurity company, but we've got our, our finance people on the call as well. Very good to see. All right, let's, uh, let's end the poll, Haley, and see what we ended up with. All right, so we're about 86% cyber, 3% finance, sorry, guy. Um, a bunch of consultants and a few people in other roles as well. That is good to know. So, you know, Rob, I think this is a, a, a great segue um, for the cybersecurity folks and IT folks. Get your finance people involved in this. We'll talk about how it can help you in getting more budget. Um, but I think it's it's a great way to get them involved because it affects them and they're they're part of the game now. Yeah. So like why don't we start there? So if I'm a I'm a cybersecurity pro or I'm a CISO and I see these changes and I know the challenges it's going to present me, and I need budget to build out my cybersecurity program, how would I go about asking you, a CFO, for more money for cybersecurity? Well, I think that up to now, um, CFOs try to stay away. There's a lot on their plate, um, and they don't necessarily want to get involved in, in an area that they have zero expertise. Um, SEC doesn't leave them much, much of a choice. And what's happening right now is that with this SEC uh, new rule, it's really going to stress test how efficient three functional groups communicate and coordinate. And it's going to be the CISO, CIO, CTO. It's going to be the second group, which is the CFO and, and the finance team. And it's going to be the third group, which is the general counsel and the legal team. And all three groups now have to uh, kind of hold this burden together, everyone is going to have to be kind of more responsible on the areas that they know more about. So no one's expecting the CFO to know anything about breaches and, and how to deal with that. No one's expecting um, the CIO and, and, and CTO to understand what materiality is and whether you have to report it and file it as part of the SEC. And we'll talk more about that. But there's just going to be a, a, a forced communication. And the sooner you jump on it, the better. Um, what also makes it very interesting is that if the CFOs are involved and they understand that there's significant risk 
they will find the budget. So I, I spoke to one of the CISOs that um, talked about the fact that when they want to get more budget, they make sure that whatever they, whatever demo or risk assessment they run, they do it on the finance folder. And the, the guide test is basically um, making sure that um, the CFO understands that there's too many people that have access to their financial statements before they're recorded. And if, if I'm telling you, if a C CFO realizes that their um, financial statements are uh, in a folder open to everyone in the company, they'll find budget to fix it, um, even, even if it wasn't part of the approved budget. So, so that's definitely a point that you can use to your advantage. Um, they need to know, you need to know, um, but CFOs uh, would be very concerned if in the last 30 days it's been opened and, and people could access it. And I'd say that the third uh, important question is if 10,000 files were deleted today, would we know about it? And many times CFOs are under the assumption that the security team has the ability to do that uh, in, a, in a quick instance. And that's not the case if you don't have the right products and, and software. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you have the benefit of working at a cybersecurity company, so you know to ask these questions, but um, I think it's, uh, it's fun for you to ask your CFO friends, like, hey, go, go ask your CISO if they can answer these questions. And they're shocked to learn that it's not as easy as it might seem, or it's not as um, in tune as you would expect it to be. All right, so, so why does the SEC care about cyber? I think, um, well, one of the reasons is, if you remember, back in 2016, the SEC themselves suffered a pretty devastating hack, right? Um, and we have a little video here talking about that. So I'm going to play that real quick for y'all. This hack puts the agency in a kind of a weird spot because they police companies getting hacked and how they disclose it. And now they've been hacked and now they've been disclosing, you know, they disclosed this yesterday after knowing that they were hacked last year. And it took all this time to figure out, did they, you know, were they in the systems long enough? Did they get non-public information and then use that information to trade, uh, you know, ahead of everyone else? So what exactly do we know now? Do we know that these these parties, these actors did use the information illicitly. With the, um, the agency's statement yesterday, they said they could have done so. They're saying the worst case scenario was that, you know, they're in there and trading on inside information. And, and generally, hackers aren't, aren't there just to look around, but they're looking for information to get an edge. So, um, so there's certainly a strong indication that uh, they did trade on inside information, and the agency said yesterday that they're in contact with authorities. So the SEC is good at uh, finding people who trade on inside information, right? <laughs> Will they be able to find these hackers and, and bring them to justice? Uh, generally, with these types of cases, a lot of the hackers are overseas, and um, it, you know, the agency tries to get ahead of any illegal profits to get uh, restraining orders on, on that cash, but it is an uphill battle for um, the agency to police someone in, in another country. Clearly, really problematic for the SEC's reputation and credibility. All right, so there you have it. So I'm sure that guy, like that, that made some waves back when it happened. Um, what's your perspective on that, and and what if that's driving these changes? I think Rob, what's what's important to note that this video, as you mentioned, was in 2017, but it actually um, it was a year after the hack took place. So the SEC wouldn't have at the time. Um, filled the requirement of the, the four-day reporting that they're talking about now. But I think that overall, we've moved in, in a significant way to a much more dangerous world. And, and overall, this ruling is very, very positive. It's basically intended to give investors timely, standardized disclosures regarding cybersecurity incidents. Um, and they're talking about materiality. So, so there's, there's been a lot of thought put into this. Um, it hasn't been done uh, um, lightly, and I think it's just part of the evolution of the world and the risks that companies are facing today that the SEC is trying to address. Um, but it definitely started uh, years ago, 2016, 2017 is where um, CFOs first started um, understanding the risks. They had to start a uh, report about any incident that took place as part of the 10K, which is the, the annual filing that takes place. But we've we've gone a long way, and the SEC is definitely pushing to make this much more of an issue uh, and make it much more transparent for investors. Yeah, where whereas now an investor might find out in the media 
um, that a company they're invested in had suffered a massive incident that's going to impact their stock price. Um, now it's going to be, I think, much better for the investors. But these are some of the points that the SEC put into their final rule, um, which is a long document. If you want to read it, it's uh, it's pretty dense. We have some summaries on our blog, but they talk about how large scale attacks, and we've seen it with things like the Colonial Pipeline, it can affect the world economy, right? These things have ripple effects, solar winds, et cetera. Like these um, attacks can be detrimental to the entire economy, to society. Um, obviously, we've seen an up, uptick in cybercrime due to black markets and things like cryptocurrency making it easy to exchange payment. Um, obviously, um, the cost and consequences of a breach are enormous. Um, I think you've said this before, Guy, like the, the cost of proactively preventing this stuff, it pales in comparison to reactive damage control, right? I think that's an important thing. Absolutely. And one of the things that um, the SEC was talking about was the fact that many recently, many investors had to find out about a breach in the media, but then the company didn't report anything in, in the standardized format. And they just wanted to make sure that everyone kind of speaks the same language. And I think it's the right move um, to kind of make everyone on the same playing field. Um, they also, the SEC chairman said in one of the interviews, you know, if, if a company had a, a fire in a factory and they would have a uh, um, significant loss, um, then that would be an issue that the company reports on. Um, but if they lost 10,000 files, no one would report on it and it would it can have severe implications as well. So they're trying to make sure that it works uh, kind of the same way. And, and I think it's the right move. Yeah. And they're like second and third order effects. I think a lot of us think about um, the cost of a data breach in terms of the ransom that might be paid or the fines that might be levied as a result of losing PII. But there's also the time it takes to investigate, the time it takes to recover and repair, like the, the sort of people hours that you burn in the event of a, a disastrous cyber attack. So minimizing it and being proactive about making sure that if an attack happens, the damage is minimal. Um, is critical. And then obviously the last point here, AI is going to change the entire game. We're already seeing it. I'm doing a session later this week on Thursday talking about the risks of generative AI and sort of some of the um, the double-edged sword here, all the productivity gains, but then the headaches it's going to create for us from a data management, data lifecycle management, and data risk management standpoint. Um, and this is just a quote from Gary Gensler, the C, uh, SEC chair um, that really backs up what you just talked about, Guy, which is they're doing this to protect investors and we're all going to benefit from a standard way to disclose um, that's more consistent, comparable, and decision useful. All right. So who, who do these rules apply to, Guy? So it, if I got this right, it's obviously public companies here in the US. Um, it's also foreign issuers who might be um, uh, trading on the US-based exchange, right? Oh, Haley, did we lose Guy here? Uh, I think I think he might be a little delayed here. Okay. All right. Well, let's hope we get Guy back in a minute. Um, but I'll go through the next couple slides, and um, you know, Guy will rejoin us when he can. So, uh, so yes, the the answer is uh, U.S listed public companies and foreign issuers. So you can have a foreign company that's outside of the US that trades on a US-based exchange like NASDAQ uh, or the New York Stock Exchange. And they're gonna be, um, they're gonna have to comply with these rules as well. Um, but Guy and I were chatting earlier and talking about how this really sets the bar for private companies as well, right? Pri private companies that might be aspiring to go public um, and also the expectation of investors and private companies to do the same sort of due diligence and um, and get uh, their cybersecurity maturity in order ahead of going public. All right, so what are the new rules? Really, there's three big components, right? So we have this four-day disclosure window um, that Guy alluded to earlier, and this is the biggest one, right? So within four days of determining that you've suffered a material incident, um, you have to file Form 8K, which We'll talk about in a minute what a Form 8K is and what it what you need to put on that form. But effectively, you have to convey 
details about the incident to the SEC within four days of determining that it is material. Uh, number two is periodic disclosure of cybersecurity risk management strategy and governance in your annual report. So public companies file this big, long 10K report at the end of every year. They do a 10Q at the end of every quarter. And there's a bunch of different sections that uh, inform investors what's going on in the business. Now we're going to have to have a whole section dedicated to cybersecurity maturity, right? And what that company is doing to ensure that they don't suffer a catastrophic breach. And that's going to take time and effort and coordination between legal counsel, CFOs, and CISOs and their teams as well. And then lastly, they want you to add cybersecurity expertise to your board and to your management team. So, you know, boards of public companies have things like compensation committees, technology committees. Now they're going to have to form um, cybersecurity technology committees or uh, subcommittees and add some expertise to the board so that they can make uh, managerial decisions about cybersecurity. All right, so let's talk about this four-day disclosure window. Um, there's been much debate in the industry about whether this is a good or a bad thing. So a lot of people who work in incident response, who are responsible for investigating incidents and, and doing uh, containment, say this four-day window is unreasonable. And actually, um, probably the biggest gripe is that there could still be an active investigation going on four days after determining that an incident is material. And there may be still zero day exploits. There might be, the adversary might still be in your environment. And here you have to be working on compiling information and exchanging that information with third party, which again, kind of creates more, or could create more exposure, having someone uh, in possession of those sensitive details while an investigation is ongoing. Um, Guy, do we have you back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I gotcha. Okay. I, uh... Sorry about the technical issues, um, having issues with the computer. So I'm trying to log in with my phone just in case. Um, but um, no worries. We got, you we got your audio perfect. So um, I know you have thoughts on the four-day window. Um, and uh, so I'm curious to hear what your, what your opinions are on it. So the four-day um, period has been definitely an area that came up a lot in the comments when the SEC first uh, published their initial framework. And a lot of companies and a lot of the comments were related to the fact that they were asking more time. Uh, the four day is important to note that it's from the moment you realize it was material. Um, so it's not just four days from the incident itself, it's four days from the moment you understand it's material. And we'll talk more about materiality in a second. Um, there were a lot of uh, requests to try and move it to five days or even longer, um, but the SEC decided that kind of the uniform uh, framework that was established in 2004 on kind of four-day reporting, um, there's no reason to change that. And, and they kept it um, as four days after a lot of consideration, really. Yeah, so, so I think um, they probably made the right call, but I'm curious what you think, um, audience, about <laughs> whether four days is reasonable or not. So I, we do have another poll question. I'm really curious to see, um, do you think this four-day window is reasonable? Is it enough time to gather all the details, do all the paperwork? Oh boy, I think uh, I could have predicted this one. Um, all right, so far the overwhelming majority is saying this is not a reasonable time window. I am curious um, if you could drop it in the chat, what you think a, a reasonable window will be. Put yourself in the investor's shoes, right? So I know a lot of you are probably incident responders responsible for um, doing triage and and uh, incident containment. So, but maybe put yourself in a, the investor's shoes. Think about some of the stocks you might own. Um, think about some of the breaches that have happened that have been these flagship breaches. Okay, 10 days, seven days, 40, 30 days. I know it depends is going to be a popular answer. As with most things in cybersecurity, is, uh, you know, it really does depend. All right, I'm going to end our poll and share the results so you can see what your peers said. So about 78% of you said that no, four days is not reasonable. And 22% of you actually said, yeah, four days is reasonable. Very good. All right, so again, four days from the point of determining whether or not an incident is material, Let's talk about uh, materiality, Guy. What, what is material? How do we determine if we need to report 
and do this whole form 8K um, exercise? So this is a big item and it, it mostly uh, relates to the CFO and the finance team and the legal team, less the, the security team, but the security team will, will have to provide kind of the framework and the background and, and, and everything that relates to, to what happened, the facts and circumstances. Um, basically, materiality is defined um, by the SEC as what would be reasonable information that a shareholder will consider important. Yeah, so, you know, as Guy said, it, it's it's sort of a fuzzy definition, right? Like, what would you consider reasonable as a shareholder? What would you want to know about, right? Like the, the example of the factory fire, that's pretty material, right? Like they're going to have to rebuild that factory. They're going to incur a bunch of costs. Um, I know we as cybersecurity professionals, we like rules. We like specifics. We like <laughs> detail. Like, uh, you know, I was thinking about this and it would be great if they could provide guidance. Like if you lose more than 50,000 PII records, or if you suffer downtime for more than a day, whatever these requirements were, if you could quantify them, I think it would be a lot easier for us to cope with. But the fact that these, uh, this definition is so fuzzy and it sort of, you have to run this reasonable test and what might be reasonable to you may not be reasonable to me. I think we're going to have a lot of kind of figuring it out um, to do. Um, wh what's your stance on that guy? Do you think the, the definition of material is too fuzzy for us to work with? I think they made it fuzzy intentionally. They, they wanted to make sure that companies still think about the quantitative and qualitative aspects of materiality and not giving a framework um, that would be too specific that would kind of keep them uh, in a framework that doesn't give any judgment. Because one of the things that came up is um, taking into consideration the impact on the disruption of the business operation, the harm to the company's reputation, the harm to the company's customer or vendor relationship, harm to competitiveness. Also, they talked about the possibility of litigation or re regulatory investigation or, or actions that might include regu regulatory actions by state or federal government authorities. So they wanted to make sure that they're kind of thinking about the business as a whole and not just talking about a specific number or a specific uh, uh, file. And, and they gave us an example that uh, even if there isn't specific harm being done today, that doesn't mean it's not material. So for instance, if an IP is stolen and nothing's happen, happening right now, but you have this expectation that it might cause you damage in the future, you should still consider it material. So there's definitely gonna be a lot of discussion in the future about how materiality is defined. And I think that kind of by trial and error, um, this will evolve over time, um, but it's very important to to have all the facts in place and get the story um, understood internally as quickly as possible so you can truly understand and talk to your legal folks about whether this constitutes materiality or not. Um, they, they talk a lot about it uh, in terms of the Supreme Court definition of materiality, which is kind of the substantial likelihood um, that the fact would be viewed by a reasonable investor as having significantly altered their total mix of information. Now, I know this sounds like big words, but basically would it, would it change your investment decision? And, and I think the problem with that is that many times um, companies might kind of side on, on, on the, on the uh, uh, air on the side of caution and decide that there isn't, there isn't a materiality aspect um, to whatever happened. Yeah. And I think this kind of stresses the importance of um, knowing what was impacted in an incident, right? Like if you can't answer the question, was any data stolen? Was our IP stolen? Was anything encrypted? If you can't answer questions about the critical assets that your company relies on, then you sort of have to assume, you know, we've all been in this situation where, you know, we don't, if we don't have an audit trail of what actually happened, we have to assume the worst. If an attacker was on a system, we have to assume that all data on that system was compromised. We have to, we can't assume, you know, the absence of backdoors until we, you know, can reasonably prove that there isn't a backdoor in that machine. So I think we're used to assuming the worst, <laughs> but it's a, it's very important to be able to identify 
what was impacted in the the event of an incident. Even and in Rob, the, in the just past to, couple, just to just to yeah. add, because I see in one of the comments, there's there's kind of a question about third uh, party suppliers and whether that changes gives you more mm. time. The SEC doesn't give you more time, um, whether it's a, a a third party or whether it was just on uh, uh, internal breach or internal information um, that was uh, um, that was taken away. Um, it it stays away from that. It, it it notes that there might be a possibility where both the company and the third party uh, need to report uh, separately, um, but you have to look at it individually in the eyes of the company, whether it's material for you, and it really doesn't matter how that happened. That's a fantastic question and a really great point. Think about like, you know, we've seen situations like with, with Microsoft, right, where you know, some of the tenants within the Microsoft 365 environment were compromised by a foreign state actor, right? That's something that Microsoft would reasonably have to report, right? People can call into question the security of, of their SaaS product. And then the tenants that were in, in, impacted, it's their data that was, was compromised. And so they would have to report as well. And I, I've sort of been doing this test, you know, looking, I, I read bleeping computer and dark reading every day. And I kind of pull up the latest news. And just yesterday, there was a big um, story about an insider threat, you know, two employees that had leaked a bunch of personal information to a journalist in Germany. Um, this is for an EV manufacturer. Um, and I'm like, would this be material? Yeah, absolutely would be. Um, if I'm an investor in this, uh, this vehicle company, um, thinking about all the ransomware attacks this year, you know, over 450 million in ransoms paid in just the first six months of the year. I can't imagine a situation where a ransomware attack of any 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 size would be considered immaterial. So uh, that's another thing to keep in mind. So maybe go through these thought exercises of you know the daily um, breaches and incidents we hear about in the news, or maybe even look at your own set of incident reports um, internally um, and and ask yourself, would this be material? And then after you determine if it's material, then maybe look at the Form 8K and what it needs and say, would I be able to fill this out? Do I have the tooling and telemetry and processes in place? Who would gather the information? What would our process be? And really stress test it, right? So what you need to put on this Form 8K are, is, are, are things like when the incident occurred, when it was discovered, whether it's active, um, the nature and the scope, what data was stolen, altered, or accessed, um, the effect of the incident on the operations, which may not be fully known at four days, right? In, in fact, for any sizable incident, it probably isn't known after four days. So that begs another question, Guy, is like, I file this thing at, at four days and I come into contact with new information about this incident. Like, I, I suppose I would have to keep feeding the SEC new details, right? So it's a phenomenal question, Rob. One of the, they've been... In the, in the comments to the SEC, there were two areas that um, came up a lot. The first area was the fact that four days, um, while the breaches might still take place, could basically give a roadmap to the hackers on how to access information. And it could also help um, kind of hack into other companies that have the same issue. Mm -hmm. And the SEC definitely took that into consideration and narrowed the amount of information required to be disclosed. And they tried to balance between the investor needs and the registrant uh, cybersecurity posture. So, so they definitely took that in, into consideration by narrowing the requirements. And kind of the second, um, the second thing that they took into consideration, um, they provided a delay in reporting. Um, if you have any national risk and, and kind of the... Uh, uh, the, the attorney general gives you kind of the uh, uh, gives you a written explanation of why you, sh you you should not report this. It doesn't mean you won't report it eventually, but it just gives you a framework to delay that reporting. Um, so it's not that it gets you off the hook, but it gets you more time. I think the vast majority of companies will have to report within four days. If things evolve, they will have to update as it as it happens. There was uh, there was a question that came up of whether several uh, breaches uh, happening with the same hacker under kind of the same event, are they considered in the aggregate in terms of materiality? And the answer was yes. Um, a first breach might not be material, but if you look at it in the aggregate, um, it might become material. 
Um, but if you have separate breaches, every single breach is kind of identified and evaluated in, in an independent way. So this is an evolving world and we'll have to see, I'm sure there are gonna be some, uh, some tweaks to this as they kind of see what companies uh, act upon and what works and what doesn't work. But the general framework uh, has been set and I think it puts, it puts a lot of pressure to get the information uh, pretty quickly. Absolutely. And then the other big element to this, um, which we won't go in too much depth here about, because um, I think it's less interesting than the four-day window, but this requirement to basically disclose to investors what you're doing about cybersecurity. Now, obviously, if you're a company and you're getting ready to do your 10K and you're a CFO or, or general counsel and you turn to the CISO and say, hey, we need to describe what our cybersecurity program looks like. We need to instill confidence in our investors that we're protecting our most sensitive assets and that we're responding to threats quickly. And we have a system and a process. Um, you now have to document that and, and get this ready for your filing. Um, actually by December 15th, anybody filing their 10K after December 15th um, is when you're gonna have to include this new section. Um, so Guy, I think this goes back to your original point of um, the collaboration between the security team, the finance team, and the legal team to really prepare this. Um, so it's, it's probably best to get started now, correct? <laughs> it's best to get started now. The SEC did acknowledge that smaller companies, uh, they, might have, um, they might need more time, and they extended that by 180 days. Um, but the standard is set, and companies will have to start working in that direction. And, and I, I heard you mentioned before that it's not going to be just publicly traded companies. This is kind of setting the standard and, and the framework, even for uh, private companies. And, and obviously, we'll have to stay very close and, and see how things evolve, whether the, any tweaks that the SEC comes out um, and changes or modifies anything. But um, the sooner you get started, the better. And I think that there's, there's some significant advantages of getting the uh, the finance team on board with with this subject because um, they'll be invested and they won't be able to ignore it and uh, who knows they might find some uh, line items on the budget that weren't planned yeah absolutely after you see the filing prepared and you look at it and you say hmm this doesn't actually feel like that great of a cybersecurity program the CISO may say well look like I can't I, I can't fabricate it, right? Like this is actually what we could afford. This is what we could do. This is what we are set up to do. Maybe that creates uh, you know, more urgency, like we said in the beginning of the call for um, more investment in cybersecurity such that they feel good about putting this in their filings. Um, which brings us to our action plan, which uh, you know, it, it put together a couple of bullets here, a few bullets um, with a suggested action plan. So number one, you want to make sure your incident response plans um, are set up to deal with this 8K and this new requirement. So stress test it, like we said, um, take a look at the form 8K, practice filling it out, do like a mock exercise. Start formalizing your disclosures for your form 10K. Um, perform a data risk assessment to understand and minimize your data breach risk. Uh, we mentioned it a little bit before, but the best thing you can do is minimize the likelihood of a material incident in my opinion, um, so that attacks are going to come, right? Attacks are going to happen. They can come from anywhere, from any device, but they're always headed towards your data. And if the blast radius is small, then the likelihood of you having a catastrophic breach or even a material incident is going to be much lower and you're going to be filling out fewer 8Ks if you have um, your house in order from that standpoint. Rob, I'll, I'll tell you something from, from experience. The the CFO and, and the legal team, they want to avoid any public filing that is unnecessary and they will do everything they can because uh, let's face it, any public filing is treated differently than than a, an internal presentation that, that is presented. So um, it's definitely something that will become at the forefront of legal teams, I expect them to to get a seat on the table in the, on this, and I think CFOs um, will have to start asking questions. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you get more and more interactions uh, between those three functions that weren't that weren't there before. And uh, it's it's going to be very interesting. 
Absolutely. Um, and boards are going to start, you know, having to look at adding expertise, right? That that's sort of another, we didn't really go deep into that one, but it is in the rules, right? Yeah. They want expertise and oversight, a specific discussions of happening periodically and consistently around cybersecurity and what this company is doing to improve its cybersecurity posture. And then lastly, I stuck this one in there, send this recording to your CFO and ask for more cybersecurity budget for your, for your team. So, you, you know, don't ever let a good uh, crisis go to waste, right? Um, another thing I wanted to just add to the presentation real quick, and we'll get to Q&A in a second, is um, this really nice sort of maturity model that PwC put together. It's linked in our blog. So if you Google SEC rules, Veronis, you'll find my blog post. Um, it's got a bunch of great resources around this topic, and uh, we'll send it in the follow-up email as well. But this is a really nice sort of ladder um, where they kind of show where most organizations are today and where they need to get to in order to make sure that they're ready for all of the new rules, which we discussed today. Um, so we have two more polls. Um, this one is, are, you know, if you work for a public company or a foreign issuer, do you feel like you're ready? Are you good to go? Are you working on it? Are you not ready at all? Or does this not apply directly to you? Um, and again, even if it doesn't apply directly to you right now, because you're not working at a public company, um, you know, it's, it's really is good to kind of put yourself through this exercise and, uh, and say, look, we're a private company, but we have investors or we have some sort of shareholder or stakeholder that cares about protecting data. Our customers, right, care about you protecting their data. Could, could we meet this standard? All right, it looks like a lot of you are working on it. Um, some of y'all are already good to go. Congratulations. Um, and some people are a little bit behind the eight ball, but that's okay. That's why we're starting this conversation. You still have some time, uh, but December is right around the corner. Give people another second to finish up the poll. All right, here are the results. Um, we do have one more poll. Uh, Haley's gonna toss it up in a minute. It's basically, you know, asking you how you felt this session went. You know, we're always looking to improve um, our webinars here at Veronis. I uh, wanna see if you got value from this session. Um, and if you need help- Putting aside the technical issues, of course, Rob. Uh, but they yeah, kept a you know pretty what? face though on, you know, that, that's the important part. Yeah, the content, the substance. Um, so uh, of course, I don't wanna plug it too hard, but Veronis does have a free risk assessment. Um, and it really does shed light on where you have gaps in your cybersecurity program, um, show you who's got access to data, um, who's, who's accessing data, detect anomalies, and then, of course, be able to automate the protection, right? You know, you may look at a risk assessment and say, oh, my God, we found all of these problems, all of these gaps, all of these exposures, but I don't know how to get out of this mess. Well, we feel you, and that's why we're building the world's best automated data security platform that uh, delivers automated outcomes, right? Automatically revoking access for people who don't need it, automatically detecting threats. And we have an incident response team here at Veronis that every um, subscriber to the Veronis SaaS platform gets access to, which will help you investigate, respond, triage, and contain threats, right? Um, so uh, I'm biased, obviously, but I think it's a great way to get started in assessing your overall risk and then improving your overall data security posture. So with that, let's take a look at the Q&A window. I know we have a bunch of questions that came in. Um, yes, the recording will be distributed. Um, all right, there was a question about small companies. What constitutes a small company? Um, if I'm remembering the detail correctly, it's either 100 million in annual revenue or below, or a total public float of 250 million, which is effectively the market cap. So if you are in that boat of 100, 100 million in revenue as a public company or, or less, then you will have a little bit of extra time to get- uh, Another 180 days. Yep. Yeah. But that goes by quickly as well. Absolutely. All right. Let's see what else we have here. Um, so the board of director role would change from overseeing to managing cybersecurity, as you mentioned. Yeah. So basically, um, there really there is no be, requirement right now to, to have cybersecurity expertise in the board. Yeah, there, there's uh, there's going to have to be more um, presence on the board with uh, with cybersecurity expertise. Um, uh, no one's expecting the board to start managing 
the uh, cybersecurity risks, but they will definitely have to be more involved. Um, there's um, a discussion about generating a committee that kind of oversees um, the risks and, and will, be, uh, will be very much involved, but the managing, um, they leave to the management teams and they just leave the oversight to the, uh, to the board members. All right. Um, questions around materiality have come up. Does that word take some bite out of the SEC's rulings? We touched on this a little bit, but what, what is your thought? What are your thoughts there, Guy? Does it, does leaving it, it uh, to, to interpretation kind of take some bite out of this? I think it's a very good question. And I think that unfortunately this, this will be best answered in, in hindsight. I don't think so. Uh, that's my personal opinion. I think that they left it vague because they wanted to see, um, how companies address the qualitative and quantitative aspects. And there are a lot of, lot of things that don't fall under a certain percentage, uh, loss of revenue, um, you know, the IP being stolen. There's just a lot of items there that keep it um, very vague. Um, I think that over time with incidents that are reported and once um, some incidents that aren't reported but are later discovered, uh, the SEC will kind of tweak um, that definition. But I think for now, it actually puts more of a burden on the company uh, because you never want to be at fault of not disclosing something that others considered material. And now you have to defend why, in your opinion, it wasn't material. So it, it would have been much easier if they just gave kind of a, a, a pure, clear definition. The burden right now is on, on the management teams. And, and that's never easy to, to handle. Here's another question uh, for you, Guy. Um, uh, do, uh, do CISOs or CFOs have uh, a line of sight to what is most sensitive or valuable within their company? Um, what, do you, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? I think CFOs definitely know what's sensitive, um, but they never know where... Um, you know, the payroll file is, sits or if it's open to everyone in the company and whether there's PII data, um, social security elements, the, the, you know, that there's a ton of information that if, if you don't have the products to, to track it, there's absolutely no way to monitor it. And even if you know it at a given point, the world's evolving, people move files, they share it, and you can, it's, it's impossible to track it. So I think if you ask CFOs, They'll know where their sensitive data that relates to the financial statements, um, where that sits. And even then, they might be surprised to discover that it's in folders that are open to everyone in the company, but they will have zero ability to, to know where the rest of the sensitive information sits within the organization. Yeah, I think even CISOs, you know, coming back from Black Hat a couple of weeks ago, that was a big topic of conversation in our, in our meeting room uh, with a lot of CISOs, which is they're kicking up data discovery and data classification projects right now, just to answer this question, what do I have? Where does it live? And they, they understand it needs to be a real-time inventory because like you said, it's changing every moment, every minute, new data is getting created and moved. And with generative AI creating crazy amounts of new data, the velocity of, uh, of data created and, and moved around and shared is gonna, be, is gonna be something to deal with for sure. Um, all right, let's see. Um, what do C well, here's a great one. What do CFOs consider when deciding whether to fund a CISOs project? Risk. I think that's the, uh, the, the decisive factor for CFOs. What, what do I gain from that investment? And I, I can tell you personally that, um, fortunately or unfortunately, there's a lot of requests to, to fund projects mm -hmm. and you have to try and prioritize. Um, especially in this environment, this ruling and this new uh, guidelines give a lot of tailwind for CISOs to go to CFOs and, and let them understand that it's, it's, it's going to impact them as well. And it's in their benefit to kind of get this to the top of the line. So um, talk to the CFOs about risk. What happens if we don't get this? And what happens if we don't address it? Um, and that's probably the best way to get um, kind of <laughs> to the top of the line. 
All right. Um, I'm just going through the chat now to see if we missed anything, but there's a discussion about um, 72 hours under GDPR. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, GDPR is kind of another standard, I think, um, to look at when, when looking at the four days. Uh, there's a point here from Brian Jacobs, four days should be plenty sufficient given that understanding that the industry standard, especially under GDPR, is 72 hours. So I want to add to that, Rob, that yeah. I think that once you understand whether it's material or not, um, then, yeah, you might, you might have sufficient time uh, to, to file the actual information within four days. The question is, how long does it take you to understand what happened? And one of the things that the SEC is very clear in its publication is that they don't want companies to just delay the understanding of whether something was material just for the sake of delaying it. So they, they put a lot of color and a lot of uh, um, information and guidelines as to trying not to delay um, the understanding of whether the, uh, the event was, was material. So I think there's, there's kind of two points. You have to make sure that you can address both of them, understanding what is material, what happened, and, and whether it was material or not, and then the actual technical filing that could actually be um, less challenging than finding out what happened. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great point, um, and which is why it's important to, to start now and to start asking yourself these questions. You know, if we were to do a cyber resiliency test right now, uh, red team, purple team exercise, would we be able to answer the questions that we would need to answer for the SEC, such as what data was impacted, was it material, um, and so forth. So uh, I think we got through all the questions. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This was a, a great session. Guy, thank you so much for lending your expertise. Um, thank you. It's great to have this CFO perspective, especially as it relates to um, this specific topic. But I'm glad we were able to talk about the CISO CFO dynamics as well. Thanks, right. everyone. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll send the recording out and uh, as well as a link to the slides and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining us.